Okay, so we are live. So, uh, good morning, everybody on the United States and Americas, and, and good evening on, uh, here in, in Europe. Uh, I'm very happy to, to continue this session of the Barcelona Rhinology School with uh, Dr. Bradford Woodworth. Woodworth, sorry, uh, he's the uh, uh, endowed professor of the James Hick, an interim chair of photolaryngology. He works in the um, University of Alabama at the Birmingham Department of Otolaryngology, and he's a really well-known research senior scientist regarding cystic fibrosis. So that's the topic that uh, join us now. And I hope uh, you will enjoy and you will learn about this n rare but not so rare uh, disease. And uh, of course, this the idea of this all this session is to improve the, the, the your your knowledge and how we can improve the, the the health the health we provide the healthcare we provide to to our kids and our uh, patients. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Brad. For... Thanks. Thanks, Cristobal. I really appreciate the invitation and um, excited to talk about one of my favorite subjects. So, um, so, so first I... off, yes. Now, so now we have your presentation. You can. Great. Is it is it looking? Um... It's in, you, I think you have to be in presentation mode. How's that? Yeah, that's perfect. Now it's perfect. Excellent. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today is the comprehensive management for cystic fibrosis chronic sinusitis. Um, these are my disclosures, uh, research support, and I have a patent that um, I, I will talk about that. So cystic fibrosis, a disease of dysfunctional anion or chloride transports, a chloride and, and bicarbonate uh, transporter. It's the predominant one on the epithelial membrane inside the sinuses and the airway. Um, this is uh, respiratory epithelium. I always call this the Rolls Royce of epitheliums, highly differentiated, highly specialized. Um, and in the apical surface of the plasma membrane, you have the cystic fibrosis transmembrane redu uh, conductance regulator. Um, it allows the efflux of, of chloride and the transport of chloride ions across the membrane. That creates a situation where you have a nice balanced mucus layer and periciliary fluid layer, allows a, a mucus rafts to, to um, extend across the airway. But when you have a dysfunction of the channel and you can't pass chloride, you get a dehydration and a overgrowth of bacteria because your mucus can't move. It's the, it's the body's innate way or innate immune system to clear inhaled um, bark bacteria, dust, and aerosols. Um, when they developed the CFTR uh, knockout pig, um, Steve Rowe took some um, piglet tracheas, and it just really shows right at birth, if you excise these uh, uh, tracheas from newborn pigs, this is called a technique called micro-optical coherence tomography. It's a technique that was developed at UAB in collaboration with Mass General. And what you see is this airway uh, surface liquid. This is the, let's see, no, well, no, it's not, there we go. So here you see the mucus rafts and the mucus extending across on a CF, um, CR positive pig, and this is a CFTR negative pig with a with a crushed epithelial layer here and, and cilia layer. And this, this really shows that the innate defect is present at birth. And this shows decreased markers in mucociliary clearance across the uh, conditions when you don't have CFTR. We recently developed a, a nasal probe that we can look at in vivo imaging of subjects with cystic fibrosis or um, versus control subjects published in uh, Science and Translational Medicine. And what it really showed was uh, using this probe, we can do in vivo imaging showing that the defect is present in live uh, cystic fibrosis uh, patients and get um, real-time data related to their um, indices of, of mucociliary transport. So periciliary liquid, mucociliary transport, ciliary beat frequency, airway surface liquid, um, it was all decreased with this. And percent ciliated surface was also decreased because you lose some cilia with uh, chronic um, uh, suppression of the airway surface liquid. So what does that mean for a uh, treatment? So, you know, treatment options for cystic fibrosis, uh, rhinosinusitis, nearly 100% of patients with major um, genetic mutations on both alleles will develop 
uh, chronic sinusitis of some form or at least objective evidence of it. Um, you know, this is the classic look for a cystic fibrosis patient. They have uh, hypoplastic maxillary sinuses as well as other sinuses. Um, they get this thickened uh, mucus layer and this pool of thick mucus that's this uh, mucus is often 60 times more viscous than a normal uh, individual. And so it pulls up and, and runs down the back of the nose. And so uh, what are the options here? You know, a lot of times people are like, okay, IV and oral drugs, antibiotic steroids, all that stuff. But topical therapies, I think, are critical when it comes to cystic fibrosis patients. So, uh, you know, saline, antibiotics, steroids. I'll talk about uh, Dornase Alpha. This is something that... Um, is theoretic has great benefit on randomized controlled trials, but is expensive and not a lot of people do it, but um, it's an option. And so these topical therapies can get in here into the sinuses. And, and the point of our role as ENTs is when they have significant disease and significant symptoms is to do surgery that allows topical therapies to work. Um, and that's why that endoscopic sinus surgery has a role. Works, uh, they work in conjunction together. So, just a little bit about evidence on uh, topical antibiotics, um, topical pilvermycin. This is something we use pretty frequently in the United States. Uh, use about 125 milligrams in a, in a saline rinse, usually a 240 milliliter saline rinse bottle. Pilvermycin, MIC for pseudomonas is one microgram per mil. The math on here, um, if you use 125, is in a 240 milliliter bottle, you're about 520 times the MIC. Um, this was uh, shown at kind of standard concentrations for tobermycin in a rabbit model that uh, Alex Chu did when he was at Penn. And what you see is basically by seven days using any of these concentrations, by day seven, you get a, a you non-detectable pseudomonas by the end. So um, using irrigations with topical tobermycin, I think is important. This was a inhalation of uh, using a vibrating aerosol that, uh, Dr. Maintz did out of Germany, and uh, what he found was that 28 days, the primary outcome was was actually changed in Pseudomonas colonies, um, and he just didn't wasn't very well powered. But the SNOT20 scores actually were significant in this, uh, so there's a little bit of evidence, like real world evidence regarding and and uh, in patients regarding to topical tobermycin, topical steroids. I do use this. This is a little bit of a controversy. Um, topical steroids are generally work really well with eosinophilic inflammation. Um, this is, there are some studies showing some polyp size reduction in symptoms, particularly in the migans position with beclomethasone, some smaller uh, studies in CF related night nasal polyps. And a point, the important point here is that it's neutrophils versus highly steroid response of eosinophilic CRS. So um, it, it's a little bit of a controversy here related to using steroids. I like topical steroids. I think there's a lot of concomitant allergies and that kind of thing as well. Um, and in general, it's it's safe, and I think it it has some evidence that there's some effect efficacy too. Dornase alpha, this is something that's very difficult to do. So uh, it's expensive. Um, there's good evidence behind it, and but by vibrating aerosol, uh, and this was done by doc, Dr. Mainz's group. And what Dornase alpha does is pulmozyme, so it cleaves long chain DNA uh, that develops from neutrophil de degradation and all the recruitment of neutrophils. And it really helps with the viscoelasticity of the mucus. So uh, there are two randomized controlled trials showing evidence of efficacy. The cost is really the, the issue. So uh, people, some people already have um, the pulmozyme. They do in inhalation um, uh, into their lungs, but it's hard to get extra Dornase alpha. Um, and, and if you can get it, great. I think I've only got like two patients on this, but it, it is a reasonable thing to do because there's good evidence behind it. To talk about the CFTR modulators, this has really changed the face of cystic fibrosis. And uh, one of the re reasons I got into cystic fibrosis research and, and everything was when I was a, a fellow, I just found that that was the most frustrating patient. Um, you do this surgery and you think you're, you do a great job and, and then they just come back and they just continue to crust and have lots of mucus coming out. And you try rinses and you do all this stuff. And, and it really is the most challenging uh, patient population. I, I, like, I like challenges. And so the, but the CFTR modulators, which have been in development since the early 2000s, and then the first one approved in 2012, really have changed the face because now you have a drug that's targeting the basic defect. So these are uh, small, small molecule um, 
uh, what are called CFTR modulators, or, or they, inter they do things to the protein. So in other words, they can help the protein fold and get to the surface. They can help the protein open. And so these, uh, uh, the evidence behind these is absolutely outstanding. The first one was the uh, Ivacaptor. This showed improvements in lung function in two weeks, and this was a 10% improvement in lung function. And substantial improvements in pulmonary exacerbations, patient reports, respiratory symptoms. So like this, this uh, really was uh, fantastic and, and was approved in 2012 in the United States. Um, then they developed a, a drug called Lumacaptor, and then subsequently Ivacaptor, uh, I'm sorry, Tazacaptor. And what these drugs do is they help the protein fold CFTR in the major defect, which is Delta F508 or um, F508 DEL, which is the main 90% of people have one copy of F508 DEL causing their disease process. So the concept behind this is to use this um, Lumacaptor or Tazacaptor. And now we've got uh, double CFTR modulators, which improve the rate of transfer of protein to the cell surface. And what that does is it improves the amount of protein and then you can use Ivacaptor to allow the chloride to efflux. And, and this really allows us um, uh, to improve the underlying defect and improve the overall uh, health of the patient. So this was Tazacaptor, uh, which had less side effects than Lumacaptor. And then what they did was it came out with a second generation one called VX445, uh, uh, Lexcaptor. And this, is a, this showed a 13.8% improvement in FEV1 in anyone with a copy of an F508 DEL mutation. So this this uh, this really was a huge game changer because it treats 90% of people. Now, you still have 10% of people um, with cystic fibrosis who don't have the benefit of using this drug. So there's still a lot of strategies that need to be um, uh, uh, researched. And, and the other thing is, you know, this doesn't completely reverse the defect. It definitely improves everything. and. Um, it shows reversal of sweat chloride concentrations, uh, the scores on respiratory domain of CF improve, um, all, these, all these great things that happen, but it doesn't uh, completely eliminate the disease process. Um, we did a, a study looking at the original Ivacaptor, and then uh, Dave Gudis recently did one with the uh, new drug, which is the Tricapta. And uh, basically both of these showed improvement in symptom, in, in uh, rhinology type symptoms and related to their, their sinuses. We know these work. We see even medical reversal of disease sometimes when people are on these uh, these drugs. So this is a really a big game changer. So what about surgery? So the, the impact of surgery is really important, right? So um, we talked about the, the interplay between the two. And, you know, the distribution of topical agents is really important. So uh, this is an evidence-based review, an EBRR, and, and basically showed the operated sinus, the delivery increases, especially large volume. There's also showing that bigger holes often are, are better for delivery. And, and that's one of the points of what I'll talk about today. Um, a lot of people will say like, oh, okay, well, you know, all CF patients have disease. So, you know, we should be operating on all these patients. And, and my argument is that there's really only two major reasons to operate on these patients. And the first is, is symptoms. So um, symptoms are really important. So you don't want to operate on someone who does not have symptoms unless it's absolutely uh, necessary. And the reason being is that you don't want that patient to end up with a, a symptomatic problem after surgery. They may be um, less inclined to do therapy because they're not having symptoms originally. And I will not operate on someone unless they've had demonst demonstrated to me that they can rinse and they've, and they've rinsed before because that is the most important thing when it comes to cystic fibrosis to clear the mucus out with physical irrigation also delivery of those topical therapeutics we talked about. So Mainz showed that there's concordant genotypes between the, the sinuses and the lungs. Um, this shows kind of a, like a, what we call, I always call a pediatric fest, right? So they have a little conservative fest, they got a little small hole in the maxillary. But what you see here is this, this spilling up of mucus and then it comes down and this mucopurulence runs down the back of the airway, down the nasopharynx and then into the lungs. And so you can see it just, just pouring down the back. And so, uh, Main showed those concordant gene types from the sinus and lower airways. So the sinuses kind of can serve as a reservoir. Now, there's a lot of people who have stable sinus disease. It's trapped. It's sequestered. They're not symptomatic. In those situations, um, I tend to pe leave people alone. Um, this is a, a only 10 to 15 percent of CF patients volunteer uh, symptoms. Um, but if you tease it out with a questionnaire, approximately 80 percent fulfill the EPOS and the ICAR criteria for chronic sinusitis. It's just, uh, you have to, yeah, you, it's important to use questionnaires and that kind of thing. Um, but 
the, the patients are overwhelmed with their other symptoms typically, so they don't often focus on their sinuses. What about quality of life outcomes with endoscopic sinus surgery? Uh, Aisha Khaled, when she was with Tim Smith out in Oregon, uh, looked at CF patients um, uh, versus regulars and regular patients. And CF patients basically had worse overall lung Mackay and lung Kennedy scores. Uh, we know this is a very refractory, um, very difficult disease. And they also had st statistically significant improvement in quality of life questionnaires. So um, this was important because it shows that quality of life does improve when you do surgery. Uh, and and my, I would argue do surgery plus medical therapy. And um, a meta-analysis basically showed that ESS has significant benefit in both sinus symptoms and quality of life in CF children. So we know that endoscopic sinus surgery is important as a part of um, overall uh, quality of life. Uh, my point of all this, though, is that you've got to be really careful about those patients who don't have, um, they have very minimal symptoms. What about pulmonary outcomes? This is a controversial area. So uh, Holtzman looked at a retrospect retrospective study in CF lung transplants and subsequent uh, sinus surgery, found no change in pulmonary function, but rehospitalization rates decrease. Uh, one of my favorite studies is my friend Casper Aeneas from Denmark. Um, he did a really nice prospective intervention cohort, uh, looked at a uh, comprehensive look at uh, surgery with two weeks of IV antibiotics, six months of colistin irrigations, 12 months of topical steroids. Uh, and basically showed at six months, 67% uh, showed no growth of pathogenic uh, bacteria. And some intermittently colonized people with pseudomonas uh, or, or were chronically infected prior to surgery, you could reverse and actually st quote unquote sterilize the sinuses. Now this is, um, this is not everybody. And, and I certainly have had uh, really good results uh, in the past, but this is not a, a routine thing. And, and you have to be really comprehensive about how you do it. And I'll, I'll show you our technique as well. One year follow-up showed intermittently colonized decreased by 38% and there was decreased IgG to pseudomonas. So one of the, the main issues though, when with, with sinus surgery is you get this, the uh, scans, you know, six months following sinus surgery and there's no radiographic change when it comes to cystic fibrosis. These are people who have all had uh, sinus surgery and you can see all this disease that's trapped in here, um, well and over the sides. It, the the max ray sinuses are really where the biggest pus burden is. They have multiple operative procedures. And what I wanted to look at when I came to UAB was a new treatment paradigm. Can, can we be more effective? And, and max-ray sinuses in particular are really the, pro, the area that I focus on. Um, the, sci the sinuses normally with mucociliary transport, it doesn't matter where you put your hole. It all comes out at the top, right? But in cystic fibrosis, because you can't clear, you just well up and then pour over the sides. And it's, so it's really an engineering problem. If you do a, a, a max drain trust me, there are smaller sinuses and you don't have any room between the turbinate and the meat orbital wall and you get this thick mucoid um, uh, purulence and it's very difficult to access with your suction, right? So in clinic, you try and clean this out, it's very difficult to clean out in and, and any meaningful way. So uh, one of the things I looked at when in 2006 with Raj Schlosser when I was a, when I was a student was um, or was a resident, was looking at modified endoscopic medial maxillectomies for chronic uh, sinusitis. And the goal of this is to make a gravity-dependent sinus. And it improves the access for debridement, improves the application of topical treatments. And in some people who are towards like transplant and whatnot, or, or maybe end of life, they, their lung function is really poor. So they, the anesthesiologists and everyone else are really concerned about putting them to sleep. And so in this type of situation, you can really clean out that, that area well in your local anesthesia or even MAC uh, and, and, and in an endoscopy suite, for example. And we, we have a really good paradigm of that here. So this shows a, the classic uh, small sinus is all trapped and, and kind of pouring over the sides. This is a technique for the modified. Um, we we leave the head of the uh, inferior turbinate and raise a medially based flap here. And this flap will go in to cover the exposed bone of the, the wall that we drill. Um, and this is the original technique we described in 2006. I'll show you an extended technique that I do now um, it, that's really helpful as well. And so drill down the max ray ridge and you know you have these loculated pockets when it comes to CF. Um, it's very, very common. You can see you can break that up. An important thing is break that up and then rate, put this flap over the exposed bone. And this shows the result that you can have. Um, this was even before modulators. Um, so you know we, we clean up these sinuses really well in a patient that's not even on modulators. Uh, and, and you can get you can get real radiographic change with these patients. This is a mid portion around this way. Some people say like, oh, you get empty nose. I never get empty nose with this because I always leave the head of the uh, inferior turbinate, um, and and the, they, the patients do extremely well with this. 
So post-operative regimen, we use three weeks of culture-directed antibiotics, uh, topical saline irrigations, um, as we mentioned, steroid, antibiotic. Uh, this is my kind of standard triple rinse. About 80% of my individuals have a pseudomonas and an MRSA uh, in today's day and age. So um, the tobermice and mupirocin combination, I really like, especially uh, immediately post-op. We do two, four, eight week follow-up and then follow-up every three months at the time of the CF appointment. This is pretty standard for uh, most of what we do with cystic fibrosis. Um, my, the CF clinic has a sa clinic the same day as us and, and we um, will see them that day. So this shows the subjective and objective improvement over that full year with uh, 23 patients in a prospective fashion. And, and this one year, um, we've got a, a significant impact in STOT22 and, and Lung Kennedy scores here. And importantly, you know, Everyone's was like, oh, well, you shouldn't do sinus surgery for pulmonary uh, function. And, and I believe that's the case. I do not think that comprehensive surgery and cleaning up the, the upper airway really helps with lung function. But what it does help with is exacerbations. And, and this was shown in this study. Um, and I think there's a pretty decent weight of evidence to this, uh, especially with Holtzman as well. And pre-surgery, what you see is the number of exacerbations and then the post-surgery in, in these patients, the exacerbations decrease. So I so using this technique and decreasing the seeding of the, of the lower airway from, from the upper airway, I think is an important strategy in uh, certain individuals. So, so if someone's having a clustering of exacerbations and they, they notice like a sinus flare up right before they get admitted, for example, those are the type of patients that I really um, will consider doing surgery. There's a technique of an extended flap. And so um, what we do is I incorporate the, the portion of the um, inferior turbinate here. And I use a, a neotip obicotti, which kind of helps with the, the actual uh, bleeding and all that stuff. Uh, so this is a little bit, it takes some time to elevate off the turbinate. Um, if you rip it up here, it's okay. You know, you can, you can just uh, use the regular flap. But this extended one can really uh, cover the entire floor. Um, one of the, my concepts of, of, uh, of sinus surgery is, is dysfunction. And so when there's a lot of dysfunctional mucosa from infection and that kind of stuff, I like to, to remove what I can and replace it with healthier um, flaps. Um, I, I use a lot of, of flaps for draft threes, for example. You can see the, the thick mucus um, and mucopurulence in here. We, we drill down this segment. And I'll use a, a, a Bobby cautery on like around uh, 20, uh, maybe a little bit less, just to kind of really clean up that mucosa in the bottom, which is really, really dysfunctional from all that chronic infection. Um, and what this does allow me to put this flap over here and replace nice, healthier skin that hasn't been exposed to infection into the sinus. And that, and that works really well. And I'll just place a nasal pour on that. I, I, I love to soak my my packing and my nasal pores and such and, and topical uh, therapeutics as well and floxin and whatnot. Um, this is, uh, this is him uh, post-op and you can see, you know, look how nicely that flap incorporates and we've really opened up this sinus and he's done tons of rinsing and we can return that sinus to normal sometimes. So um, that's really helpful. So I'd like to go through a couple of cases. And um, so my first is this uh, like a 15 year old, this is a classic one. She's a, a G551D, F508 Dell. Uh, she's been on Ivacafter. This is back before they had Trikafta. And uh, she started on Ivacafter six months ago. This, so this is back in 2013, I think. Um, her FEV1 improved 10%, so that was great. Um, she had a, but she still had headache, postnasal drip, congestion, and just a lot of drainage. And she had uh, Pseudomonas and MRSA, 21 previous sinus surgeries, right? So, so this is the, the classic uh, CF patient is just constantly getting operated on. Um, and this shows, you know, uh, these modulators aren't always the perfect answer, right? So this, this patient um, didn't have really great surgery. She's got, they chomped her turbs here. She's got lots of crust. Um, they have, she has really poor access to the upper portion of her sinuses here. Um, and kind of a tight nasal airway, even though she's rinsing, she can't really get into some of these areas up here. So this is, uh, this is really important. So um, after, you know, our surgery, which basically now I've got the sphenoid nice and open, we've got good access up here. We've got the frontal open. This, this scenario now, 
Um, this is the exact same patient. She's on a modulator. It just shows that, that surgery is adjunctive to other medications as well. Now, some people can, after taking like Trikafta or whatnot, reverse a lot of their, their disease. But if they've got a lot of obstructive issues, you still have to operate on them. I think the great thing about that is that if they're on modulators and you operate, you can actually... Um, you, you have a really good chance of returning their, their sinuses to a normal status. So uh, here's another one, 22-year-old. This is kind of my management for funnels. Uh, funnel sinuses in CF, like a lot of people are like, oh, I do a draft three for it is and all. And, but, but what you find with draft threes is these are really small funnels mostly, and they have a small pathway. So um, there's not a huge amount of pus burden up there. And, and the problem with the draft threes is you're drilling out all this bone and then expecting that area to stay open. You can use flaps and graphs and that kind of stuff. And I think that does help. But what it, what ends up happening is you make a larger area for pus burden than what they originally had. And, and so I, my preference to this is my goal is to be able to clean them in clinic, right? So um, this is a classic, classic example, small frontal recess pathways here. So you got this big block of bone here, right? So if I do a draft three, this is going to be uh, just a big area where they can collect pus. This is a 70 degree scope looking up and, and I, I show this kind of in real uh, real world uh, circumstance. See, they've, she's got this little partition here. Watch my, see how I'm trying to bite that? They get very osteotic. So it's important to, to take down all those partitions, those osteotic partitions. And that's a two A, so that's not really good, but I like doing this hand instrument two B. This is one of my favorite techniques with CF. So what I do is I try and just extend that over to the septum, just with a hoseman, just taking that upper part. Um, if they have a medial shelf, it's just an excellent technique. And what that does is it doesn't trash any of the mucosa around it. It allows me good access to, to clean and clinic. So this is a vein alia cannula. So this is the classic um, old school instrument that I that I've repurposed for nowadays for cystic fibrosis. So um, it, as long as they've got like a, a, a yeah, you try and get that pathway as large as you can in a, in a mucosally sparing fashion. But um, the, the vein can is fast, it is, is really great for cleaning out these sinuses in clinic. It's great to have some of these uh, available if you want to have a CF practice. Um, and, and the other thing is some people say, oh, well, you know, people won't tolerate the breathements in clinic. Um, tetracaine works phenomenally well. And we have these directional, directional sprayers now for example, um, where you can bend them and you put it into the nose and up into the frontal sinus, you can spray it and just kind of leave it for a little bit and you can clean them out really well doing this type of technique. So um, there's another one with, uh, this is a gentleman, Burkhold area, um, declining FEV1. This is a patient who, re who with really good cleaning, actually his FEV1 did bump. Um, he had 40 endoscopic sinus surgeries, terrible headaches uh, with drainage. There's a patient that I actually did do a draft three because he was out of the ordinary, right? So he's got a very large frontal sinus. He's had erosion up here. Um, and this is the classic example of not doing uh, what it takes to gain access, right? So look at this septal deviation that's up here. So they, they tried to open this up without taking care of this problem. And, and here in this situation, a draft three is going to be very helpful to, to gain access there. Um, I do use a, a combination of uh, techniques. I I will uh, uh, just I use these graphs and as well as laterally based flaps. And nowadays I'll actually extend complete flaps that, that cover the exposed bone. So it works really well. But this shows how you can clean out that area. And you can see he's like still pussy and he's got some purulence and everything. Uh, but he's much more accessible. Okay. So and, and this is in clinic. We've sprayed some tetracaine up there. We can clean it really well. Uh, this is a very important um uh, type of technique. And, and we can extend the, the types of antibiotics in there. And you can see the, his overall bur disease burden is much less. Now he, this was before Trikafta uh, and he looks fantastic nowadays. I should probably put an updated video in there, but, but uh, the Trikafta in combination with this surgery has done wonders for this guy. This shows my, uh, you know, proactive care is really important. So I, there's a lot of reactive care when it comes to CF patients. We have uh, the classic model is, okay, they get admitted for pulmonary exacerbation, they consult ENT. ENT just does a quick, you know, 15-minute fest, just clean out some pus, and then they just go back. They don't see them in clinic. And, and, and so 
I'm very intentional about seeing those patients in clinic, cleaning them, staying on top of their disease process. Um, if they get admitted, you know, if they've had the surgery that I've described, you can clean them in the endo suite. We have this endo suite in the back hall. It doesn't, ex I mean, I can do this right in between cases that I have normal during the day. Uh, sometimes you will have like three or four patients admitted um, who will just put in the, the endo suite. It doesn't take anything from my OR time. They do it under Mac. It, it works really well. Um, this is uh, so from our current opinion in um, um, pulmonology. This is uh, just my general paradigm for how I deal with these patients. So uh, sinus symptoms, um, unexplained focus of infection, or, or you know, there's the multiply recurrent exacerbations that, that kind of come together. Uh, they get old laryngology consult, um, typically use an nasal endoscopy culture. I like to check what their microbiology is. Um, often systemic culture-directed antibiotics. If they improve, I usually obviously put them on rinses and that. Uh, that sort of thing. I actually don't use oral steroid tapers um, uh, typically uh, anymore. And it just, there's a lot of diabetics and everything. And I, I just don't think it's very um, cost, um, very effective. So, but the topical steroids, the saline irrigations, topical antibiotics, uh, consider Dornase Alpha. Um, if they have continued symptoms, obviously a CT scan. With a post-transplant patient, usually within a, within a year, if they, they're still having a lot of sinus issues, you want to preserve those uh, lungs. I actually will do a more aggressive uh, surgery and then go ahead with um, the rinsing to try and decrease the amount of pus that's getting down into their airway. Um, obviously, do okay. You can observe them. Um, but consider that extensive surgery with the wide antrosomies, modified meal maxillectomies. I think that that I, I've I had like three patients in my career at UAB that I operate on and they were first time operative CF patients and I did not do a modified because I was like, well, I was just like, you know, this is their first operation and whatnot, but I regretted it every time. And so every, I've never regretted doing a modified in these patients. Um, Post-operative treatment, this is that Regimo I was talking about. Uh, again, oral corticoid steroid taper, I don't do anymore. Repeat endoscopic cleaning and, and debridement. So uh, we recently were involved in a, um, uh, Cis Fibrosis Foundation put together a team of a uh, team of us to look at um, uh, consensus recommendations, and I just want to go through some of those with you. These are the essential highlights of it. Um, CF infection control guidelines are recommended. Um, ENT consultation for CF patients with pers persistent ENT syndrome uh, symptoms. They recommend a quality of life tool, like I mentioned earlier. Nasal saline irrigations. Um, uh, with treatment of allergic rhinitis, concomitantly intranasal corticosteroids, uh, rinses, whatnot. Endoscopic sinus surgery for those who have symptomatic CRS, refractory appropriate medical therapy. And then um, perioperative, they recommend perioperative airway clearance. This is a patient who say they have a lung function of like 45% and um, you want to do surgery. It's a good idea to do perioperative clearance beforehand. We'll often admit them, get them teed up and tuned up for the surgery uh, with the CF team. And a collaboration with the CF team is really important. Um, they, they actually were against the routine use of systemic corticosteroids. And like I said, I don't do that anymore as well. Um, we also recommended against routine use of intranasal corticosteroids by nebulizers because nebulizers don't work well. Um, and then ESS for the sole indication of declining lung function. I think this is still an indication for those uh, patients who have these clustering of exacerbations, though. And then they also recommended uh, not against adenoidectomy alone or balloon sinuplasty. So um, options were extended sinus surgery. Um, I think, you know, from my personal standpoint, this is, I, I think, really important. Um, perioperative IV antibiotics uh, and then use of sinonasal topical antibiotic treatment. I think there's some decent evidence behind that. And I, I think that Casper and myself have, have shown that. And then intranasal Dornase, which actually was, there was a vote for a stronger um, endorsement of this, but the problem is the cost, right? And then there was no con consensus on um, intranasal corticosteroids by irrigation. However, uh, we, we ended up doing an EBRR um, uh, with uh, some of our group, um, Casper was in this as well, and, and Dave, Dave led this up. So uh, what the, the EBRR showed, or what we, what we showed in the evidence, was that topical corticosteroids, you know, the grade of evidence isn't great, but we basically showed that uh, we, we wanted topical steroids as an option um, rather than any sort of uh, lack of consensus. And then topical antibiotics, and of course, recommended uh, saline, safety R modulators, and endoscopic sinus surgery. So this is kind of the latest documents. These were all published just recently. 
And so you can peruse those at your discretion, kind of see what the, the uh, uh, updated guidelines are. So we talked to you a couple minutes about the future. So this is uh, something we've really been um, interested in this drug delivery. So there's a lot of things with steroid eluting stents, for example, and a, we, we wanted to do an antibiotic coated biodegradable stent. This is not available, um, but we've done a number of studies on this, um, uh, both in vitro and in, in in vivo. We we use rabbits with this, and and we get these stents manufactured, and we do a, a double. Uh, we do ciprofloxacin first, and we found that this actually worked very effectively for uh, decreasing pseudomonas and and clearing up CT scans in rabbits who were infected with pseudomonas. However, what we find is the burst release on these is very quick, and then it um, just kind of peters off just over over uh, over two weeks. Um, what we did was we actually used ivacaftor because ivacaftor is a CFTR modulator. It's a hydrophobic molecule, so if you surround the, the ciprofloxacin with ivacaftor, you get the sustained release over three weeks of uh, ciprofloxacin release as well as ivacaftor. Um, and we have great results with this in both in vitro and in um, in rabbits, and so you get a, significant reduction in PA1 biofilms, uh, uh, preformed biofilms, uh, very little remaining um, uh, pseudomonas. So, so that's something that we're really interested in, in developing, and I think it's going to be part of the future. And finally, I want to leave you with this. So this is, this is really the future for all patients with cystic fibrosis um, and other, even other people with uh, genetic diseases. So this is called the CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing system. You, some of you may have heard of it. Um, they're looking at it for sickle cell disease, but cystic fibrosis, uh, this would be really great for 100% of people who have gene mutations. So I'm just going to play this for you um, so you Our can hear. Our goal is to replace and repair the abnormal DNA sequence to create a functional protein and restore normal mucus. One way to do this is to use gene editing technologies that cut out and replace defective parts of DNA, such as CRISPR-Cas9. The CRISPR-Cas9 repair system has three components. A guide RNA that seeks out and binds to a specific location in the DNA. The Cas9 nuclease enzyme, a type of molecular scissors that cuts the genetic sequence at the precise binding site. And a repair template containing the correct genetic sequence for the gene. Once these three components are introduced into the cell, the guide RNA binds to and activates the Cas9 nuclease. Now, the Cas9 nuclease, the molecular scissors, can search the cell's DNA for potential targets. At a potential target site, like the one shown here, Cas9 unwinds a section of DNA to see if the guide RNA sequence matches. If the DNA sequence matches the guide RNA, the Cas9 nuclease cuts the DNA to create a break in the strands. To replace the mutation with a normal sequence, a repair process is used that precisely edits the DNA. For this editing process to work, a short piece of DNA template that contains the desired normal gene sequence is introduced into the cell. The cell uses this fragment as a template and copies the new sequence as it repairs the broken DNA. Once the first strand has been repaired, the template falls away, and the other strand of DNA uses the repaired strand to fill in the remaining gap, leaving both strands with the corrected gene sequence. The cell then uses the corrected DNA strand to produce a functional CFTR protein that allows the proper flow of salt and fluids through the cell membrane. Mucus returns to normal within the lung, allowing the cilia to beat freely and clear the lungs of germs and irritants. All right, so that's the future. Um, I think we're probably 10 years away. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's being done in vitro, and I know that um, uh, Jaker Nyack has some funding from the NIH related to this as well, um, uh, related to cystic fibrosis and using CRISPR-Cas9. Um, so in summary, sinus considered a bacterial reservoir. Surgical access is important, as I mentioned, in combination with topical drug delivery. Um, I think it can reduce pulmonary exacerbations if done properly with a comprehensive approach. Um, it is important to maintain coordinated care with pulmonologists and encourage compliance. 
and be proactive rather than reactive. Uh, CFTR Magilate has really have dramatically impacted sinus treatments. Um, patients do a, ton, a, a lot better. Um, they're not uh, completely reversing the problem, but but uh, patients are doing so much better with these with these uh, newer treatments. So, uh, thank you, and I take any questions. Amazing, Bradford. It's a really, really an a an a master class review of all your work. I'm very grateful because you shared all your your tips and tricks that that's I, at least for me is my philosophy to to share th those kind of things because the other things are in the in pubmed in the in in the papers and whatsoever so thank you very much you're welcome um do, do i stop sharing here uh I, yeah we are we are yeah there you go perfect yes well i have a couple of questions yes sir just so, um, I really like this camera that you developed. What, what exactly do you see with this tiny camera? Oh yeah, so um, do, do you remember the, um, so uh, you can look at some of the papers online and we have some videos yeah. online, that kind of thing. But um, at the second uh, one where I was looking at the pig tracheas and uh, you had the suppressed cilia on the second frame on the video. Yes, so that, yes, was, yes. that was taking an ex vivo trachea, right? Okay. So we developed, we developed a nasal probe. And so we can see what you saw there in a patient. Cool. So you can actually put it in the nose. Yes. And then um, it, it stabilizes the signal and it takes the image. And so you can see in real time what their mucociliary transport rate is, what their right. airway surface liquid depth is, pericellular liquid, ciliary beat frequency. And it's all done real time. It's, it's phenomenal. Wow, it's amazing. Have you yeah. used it in, in, in normal chronic rhinosinusitis? Yeah. So, yeah, we've, um, so before COVID, we had recruited around 12 patients. Uh, we're, we're still, we're still doing that. Um, we, we gotta, we gotta kind of, <laughs> we gotta continue doing that. Yeah, sure, um, sure. Something that's kind of put on the back burner, but, but yeah, that's, that's correct. Um, there, the other thing about this technique, you can, you can actually differentiate like a eosinophils, for example. So something that uh, people are looking at um oh, it's, it's pretty great. really nice for in the typing your patient and then you can yeah exactly for yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, amazing amazing yeah. congratulations so, so another question is regarding the symptoms do you actively um ask for the symptoms or because of course yeah we know that if we actively ask for nasal symptoms you know nasal symptom, symptoms mostly of uh, most of this patient will have, but w where you put the balance between the, uh, because if you, if the, those symptoms, even though they are there, they don't bother the patient. Right. That's an important point. And it's also important to, um, and it's a, just like for anybody, right? So yeah. regular chronic sinusitis patients, it's like, what's the burden of your quality of life? So yeah, sure. the goal is, you know, what, what's your quality of life? What, you know, is this something, and you know, it, it could be something like they don't have a bunch of congestion, but they've got really bad forehead pressure, right? Because their, yep. their frontal sinus are, are clogged or whatever. So you, know, you could be operating for one symptom in, in that scenario, right? So, um, so I think it depends on, on the weight of the symptoms. I, I, the SNOT 22 is just helpful because it makes people think about, okay, well, this is really what it is. So, so it allows you to do interventions, like conservative interventions, even like, oh, hey, go on some rinses, right? So uh, try some rinses for a little period of time. And um, here's the other point. And I don't know if I mentioned this is I never operate on someone who's it, like, and it, trust me, I've done this before, <laughs> operating on someone and then they're non-compliant, um, you will not help them. You okay. will not help them. So like doing, doing surgery, on a non-compliant patient does not help them. I, I, I'm 100% convinced of that. Uh, you, you could turn one problem into another. So one of the things like for modifieds is, you know, normally they're they're pulling up mucus and pouring over, right? So yep. if you open them up wide and they don't rinse, what can okay. happen is all that mucus kind of comes out into the nasal airway, um, causes a bunch of obstruction, um, and then, you know, get the slides of, of stuff that come yes. down the back of the throat. And so, so if they're not rinsing, that's really important. And, and the other thing is, so people's like, there's some there's some people who are like oh well you know debridements don't work that's been proven I'm like that's a bunch of crap so um, yeah yeah so I, I, so, yeah. so when you do a comprehensive approach like this and you actually clean them out in clinic it's almost like you're redoing surgery right yeah. so 
So I would make the argument if you don't, so then you don't believe surgery works, right? So, yeah, exactly. so, so the point is, is you're, you're resetting their system if they've got anything. Um, and you know, like before modulators, like I, I get, I get some people just doing the surgery and doing the rinses who looked absolutely amazing. And, and so that was really great, but you have that certain uh, amount of people who, no matter what you do, they still have some crusts and debris and, and you just kind of keep that clean, keep that clean. I think that keeping that overall burden down is very helpful for the lungs and the overall um, symptoms and whatnot. Um, even with rinses, it, it, it's important to clean those sinuses when they come back. Great. And do you have any cutting point of, of this not 22 to, to, to have a, like this, at this I actually level, it's a red light. So, you know, I actually don't have a cut point because yeah. um, you could have someone who, you know, they may express uh, you know, obviously cough is always five on, on these things, right? Because yeah, they have many nice. issues. Um, they're, they're sinonasal complaints, though. I mean, uh, some people are like, oh, I don't want to undergo surgery, even though I got congestion and pressure and stuff. And, you know, I never push anything. I, I, I'd i rather have patients um, be more aligned with what we're doing and, and on board, right? So you don't want to drag someone to the operating room uh, based on um, a, a score. You really got to weigh the overall patient. And you may have a patient who has a really low symptom burden again, but they have one specific symptom that drives you to the OR, right? So the, like the okay. forehead pressure we mentioned, that's, yeah, that's yeah. part of it. Um, and, and overall, like I always try and get a comprehensive sense of, of are they going to, you know, have they demonstrated that they can rinse? Have they, uh, are they on board with the treatment plan and, and, and what we're doing? Um, and, and it may be a situation where they might not be that symptomatic, um, but they are having clustering of exacerbations. Um, typically those exacerbations though are like, oh, I flare up my sinuses and then I get admitted, right? And I start yeah. coughing and I get admitted. And, but in between after their IVs and stuff, they don't have any symptoms, right? Okay. Or they're yeah. fine, but yeah. then, they, then they flare up again. And, and so those are the situations that I'm, uh, even though like their baseline symptoms aren't that bad, I, if I get them on board with rinsing and I, and I feel like they're, they're going to be compliant afterwards, we will go ahead and, and do surgery in those situations. Um, but that's going to be your less common scenario. And remember, I don't, um, I probably operate on maybe 15% of 15, maybe 20. I don't know. It's hard to, hard to know, but um, of the overall CF patients that I manage. Um, and, and so it's not everyone who gets a surgery, even though they might have some objective disease, especially now. Like I don't operate as uh, nearly as much as I used to because of the, the modulators. Um, but I, I just did a CF patient last week who um, was on Trikafta. Uh, lungs were doing great, but sinuses, not so much. Like had a bunch of disease in her maxillaries when I got in there. I was breaking up all this pus that was there and whatnot. But I guarantee, I can almost guarantee that patient is going to do really well because uh, the, the surface actually looked pretty good, but there were just, you know, kind of these loculated pockets and, and trapping and everything. Yep. So you get all that open and the trikafta works and they're rinsing and it, it, it's very helpful. Amazing. Amazing. And, and, and regarding, do you visit all the, the cystic fibrosis patient of your, of your hospital or, or does pulmonology send it to you when they think they, they need you? Yeah. So that's a really good point. I have, um, I have two partners who also manage CF now. So um, I don't see all of them, but, but in general, if someone's, um, so for example, uh, pediatrics, I'll, I'll, I'll handle like the really bad pediatric cases. Um, but you know, our, we do have PZ and T's over there too. So they, they do a good bit of that, that stuff. Um, I, I've trained a couple of them, so they've kind of gone along the same lines, but, but in, in, a, in essence, when, um, they transition, they always get an assessment by us every okay. single time, even if they're asymptomatic because they want yeah. a, a overall, and it may be someone who asymptomatic, not draining, looks good. Um, they might have some trap stuff here and there, but uh, if they're if they're doing well symptomatically, we're like, okay, well, you, you don't need to follow up every three months. We can maybe see you once a year, check on things, see how you're doing. Um, if they, if there are some people who have like a, say they have like a trapped frontal sinus that's asymptomatic, right? There's always a situation like, well, I mean, do you do you undrain undrain that? Do you do you go in for that? If they're not symptomatic I, and they're compliant, obviously they're following up with CF and everything. Uh, we can follow up with imaging, you know, down the road, that kind of thing. Uh, if they start coming symptomatic or have any erosion, we go ahead and treat it. Okay, great. Uh, and, and the last one, do, do you give some uh, pre-op treatment? Yeah, um, so, yeah, no, that's, that's right. So um, I, 
I will not operate on someone who hasn't rinsed. And so, um, so for example, I'll get these consults all the time. So say someone is, is comes to UAB, they've been treated elsewhere. They get admitted through the pulmonary service, right? They'll consult me in, uh, in the pulmonary service. I'll go talk to them. I'll be like, okay, so all right, what are you doing for sinuses this and that? They may be symptomatic, but they're like, um, no, I don't do anything. I, I've never done anything. Um, in that scenario, I literally would be like, okay, you're going to do rinsing okay. for this hospitalization. And then you're going to come rinse at your, when you're at home and you're going to come back to my clinic and we're going to reassess things endoscopically. We're going to discuss your symptoms and we're going to go from there. Okay. And the so, so that's very important. I do not. So, so you, I, I may operate on someone for the first time if they've got a history of rinsing they've you know they're they've got confirmation from their family members yeah oh no they rinse all the time they, and if they're, re and they're really compliant and, and the, there's a really good assessment from pulmonary um i i might operate them on that on that um visit yeah. and and if their lung function is poor um we do do the perioperative uh kind of teeing up so and again this is done in conjunction with pulmonary it's very important to have a good relationship with them uh, you know, for myself, uh, again, I'm a senior scientist at CF. Uh, it's full of pulmonologists. We all get along really well. We, we collaborate really well. Um, uh, and not just CF. I mean, bronchiectasis patients, uh, non-CF, um, uh, PCE, yeah. and anything like that. So so that's all really important, again, for also building a practice and, and making sure you have a good collaborative effort uh, to create a comprehensive management of these patients. Yeah, exactly. And and when you talk about rinses, you you refer to just saline or or always uh, it, it, antibiotics and corticoids. It, it depends. Um, you know the the issue has always been okay. Well, you know you see that we showed that that film or the yes. we have the the stuff here and you got the small maxillaries and you know they're rinsing and you know nothing's getting in there, right? But exactly. and that's why like the big surgery helps. But I I'm almost. I'm almost like, okay, I don't care what it is. Just show okay. me that you can do it. You know what I'm okay. saying? Because we're going we're gonna to do a bunch of stuff afterwards as well. I mean, a lot of times we'll put them on some triple rinse. A lot, a lot of these patients have had, you know, previous surgery. They've got some holes, you know, it might help them in that, in that little uh, term, even just symptomatically. Um, but the point is we got to make sure that they are rinsing before we operate on them. Okay. Amazing. Perfect. So Brad and, and, and kids can rinse, man. I mean, I, if you, Pete's, uh, you know, get, get, get the parents involved and like, oh yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they can be really motivated. So yeah. yeah I mean, sure. those early adolescent, like, uh, <laughs> they're more difficult, right? They're, exactly. They don't want to do anything yeah. and they just want to hang out with their friends oh. and not, not go to the hospital. I, yeah. I'm tired. I don't want to do it. Yeah, anything. exactly. exactly. <laughs> so. Amazing. Brad, thank you very much for, for your time. Um, You're welcome. I know it's, it's an effort. Um, yeah, no, no, it's great. So Love thank it. you. Uh, have a really nice weekend. You have the all day today. We are finished the, the day, but yeah, you're finished at the end of the day. For sure, you have a, a nice day, and and thank you. And you have a, a new friend here in Barcelona. If you come, love please, it. Please contact me, um, and hope we can see each other in in some meeting or something like that. That'd be great. Yeah. Are you are you going to the uh, Milan meeting in in October? I've been invited. Uh, but I'm trying to arrange because I have two things, so I'm I'm managing to. Okay. All right. See. Yeah. Well, if you're there, I'll see you there. Okay. Are you, you're going? Oh, yeah, I'll be there. there. Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. If I great. see, I, I will tell you. Tell you. Great okay. To see you. Thank All you, right. Brad. Well, thank you so much. Bye -bye. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Thanks.